Thanks, and we are extremely grateful for sharing this space with you today. To start, my Black Bear friend and I would now like to welcome Cindy, Hadley, and Corin to begin the webinar with a brief overview of child welfare and Bill C-92. This is just our gym. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Cindy. So very good afternoon to, and good morning to everyone. It's a real honor to uh, share space with Corin and with Hadley. Um, and thank you, Shelby, and for the introduction and for facilitating the section. The, the structure, as Shelby said, is that there will be an overview of Bill C-92, followed by national standards, which are in the Act. And then there is also constitutional challenges, one in, from the Quebec government uh, challenging the Canadian constitutional status of, the, uh, of C-92, but there's also an interesting case in the United States regarding the Indian Child Welfare Act that may or uh, may not inform what happens here in Canada. There's also questions about jurisdiction and the implementation of this law, and then uh, equity. Uh, in terms of what are the resources to make sure that those self-determining uh, visions are available. Finally, we'll end up with some strategies and moving forward. So that's what we were hoping to do today. And uh, yeah, I'll just go to the next slide. So one of the things that's really important to know uh, before we begin is why First Nations children come into care. And I say this because um, I think sometimes we think about jurisdiction alone being the recipe to be able to address what is a very tragic and chronic separation of First Nations, Métis and Inuit families in child welfare care. And before that, through the 60s scoop and residential schools. So when we think about what are the causes of this type of uh, chronic removal, uh, these are the things that we need to keep in our, our minds. It's poverty, it's poor housing, it's mental health and addictions, and uh, it's also domestic violence. And all of these things together put families at higher risk for child welfare interventions. So, the act as Hadley and Corin are gonna get into contains some provisions around this. And as I will note later, um, those provisions are not always backed with securities for funding to be able to materialize these things. So when you're thinking about what prevention is or when you're thinking of a strategy to really strengthen families, it's these key building blocks that we have to build something on. And another key thing to keep in mind, and we'll reinforce this when we get to the funding, it's not just the level of funding, it's a structure of funding. I think we are, many of the viewers on here will remember uh, that in some of the treaties, there's still the $5 a year uh, that people are given. Well, that might've been a lot back in the day when the treaty was striked, but uh, $5 doesn't get you very far now. And that's the type of thing that we need to watch, especially because children's needs and families needs are dynamic. And we already know from the pandemic that uh, from international examples and from Canadian examples and First Nations examples, that there's been greater stress on families. So we're likely to see higher needs for uh, these types of services uh, going forward. So I'm in a uh, kind of, the, I think that's one of the important pieces to go. Next slide, please. So this is why equity is so key. Um, I'll be talking more about the Spirit Bear Plan later, but another one of the things that gets as an undertow to First Nations children actually being able to um, live the lives they wish to have to stay safely in their families are the inequalities across all public services. 
And um, I, you hear me saying the word First Nations now, and I'm using that intentionally because the federal government funds services on reserve for First Nations children in the Yukon and has done so at lesser levels. The Spirit Bear Plan costs, asks for costing out of all those inequalities and things like water, sanitation, early childhood, all the rest of it, and then creating a plan, a Marshall Plan to address that. This, in my view, is going to be very important to the success of C92 for First Nations communities. Uh, the, because if you build a child welfare law on a foundation of gross inequality and in public services, that are, then I think you're going to have some challenges going forward. Uh, but I will uh, turn it over to Corin now, who is gonna, and Hadley, who are going to take us through most of the legal stuff. Because as you all know, I'm not a lawyer. I just uh, just an interested uh, person who's been working on funding and child welfare for a number of years. Thank you very much for that, Cindy, and thank you uh, for the introduction, Shelby. It's really great to be here with all of you. So we're just going to take you through a brief overview. Uh, some of you may this may you may have missed part one or some of our other sessions. So um, so Bill C ninety two. Uh, there's no short. Uh, form word for it. It's an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families. And it's the first federal legislation on the subject of Indigenous child and family services. Um, and it talks about, it affirms that inherent in that there's inherent Indigenous jurisdiction over CFS uh, as a Section 35 right uh, uh, in Canada. And it enables, a it created this national minimal standards for CFS delivery for all Indigenous children and families. So it created a floor to say, look, here's some national standards. This must be the minimum that you must meet when you're dealing with Indigenous children and family. It applies to First Nations, non-status, Métis, and Inuit children living on or off reserve. And before, there was only, there was usually legislation regarding uh, First Nation, uh, some Métis and some Inuit, but this includes it's all encompassing. So it's all encompassing of all Indigenous children, regardless of their status or where they live. This act was enforced in January of 2020, so some time ago, pre-COVID. Uh, and then, the, but the national standards apply as of that date. So the national standards have been in effect for over one year, and then there was the opportunity for Indigenous groups to create their own legislation. So I believe there's maybe one First Nation that now has their own legislation that is in effect. And I believe there's many more that are steps behind uh, just waiting for their opportunity to be able to have their own legislation and it will prevail over provincial child and family services legislation. I also just want to add my thanks um, to Shelby and it's, it's always uh, great working with and having a conversation um, with Shelby and Corin and Cindy. Um, so Bill C-92, um, we, we had this titled the good, the bad, and the still unknown or the unknown part two. And very high level, just some, some things that we see as very positive, um, some negative things we're concerned about and, and the unknown um, that is still out there. This act, there's no question, um, this was much needed change. Um, as, as, as Cindy points out, um, child welfare happens in a larger context of inequity um, and concerns, and we can't ignore that. Um, and this act was a response to the first uh, four TRC calls to action in the TRC final report. Um, decades of Indigenous advocacy and activism, um, including from Dr. Blackstock, um, and a response to cases, um, to some extent, the Caring Society case, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but also Brown in Canada. Um, and Brown in Canada is a so-called 60 scoop case uh, where it was acknowledged that great harm occurs um, almost no matter how, how healthy otherwise um, the, the home is for Indigenous children that are raised in non-Indigenous homes outside their families and communities. Um, and also research done by NICWA and other attachment research that really shows um, the importance of those ongoing lifelong relationships with families, with communities, um, with relatives um, for Indigenous children. Some of the concerns we have, some missing pieces, um, there's no accountability written into this act, there's no remedies written into this act, and that's come up in some of the case law. 
Um, there's also no commitment to funding. Um, and there's some concern over Canada claiming that this act addresses the Caring Society case. Um, and, and Dr. Blackstar will talk more about this that a little bit later on. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, typically when a new law comes out, you have, uh, you have practice guides, you have uh, the government producing information webinars and sessions so people really understand the new law. There hasn't been anything like that for, for C92. There aren't regulations or policies or anything like that yet that creates uncertainty. Um, this is a concurrent jurisdiction model, which is a fancy way of saying both the provincial and the federal statute is going to apply, um, as well as Indigenous laws. And again, there's just no clarity or transparency around funding um, and the responsibilities um, or framework for funding for the national standards part or for the jurisdiction part. So just to talk an overview, what, what was the purpose of this act? It's set out in the act itself. Um, the purposes of this act is to affirm inherent Indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services, to set national standards, and to contribute to the implementation of UNDRIP. Um, and if you, when you're interpreting an act, you look also at the preamble. What does the preamble say? And you can see in the preamble, um, talk about Canada's international human rights commitments, the legacy of the residential schools and wanting to address that. Um, the, the correlation, um, the really uh, crushing connection between CFS and missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that came out in the National Inquiry, um, the importance of reuniting Indigenous children with families, uh, Indigenous rights to self-determination, Canada's commitment to work um, toward reconciliation and reform, and, and the recognition of calls towards substantive equality um, and funding that will support that. Um, insofar as how this act works, it is not going to displace, it doesn't erase the provincial acts, um, but where things are different, where this act requires something more, um, this act prevails, um, and where Indigenous governing bodies have legislated in this area and followed the steps in the act, which we'll talk about later, that law prevails. Um, so it's not a suggestion. We've, uh, we've, we've done presentations actually uh, to lawyers um, who say, well, we hope the province incorporates this, you know, like uh, we're happy about these new policies. These aren't policies, these aren't suggestions. This is actually law and the national standards particularly is law now and should be being complied with. Thank you everyone for that brief overview of child welfare and Bill C-92. It really helps to ground us uh, for the further discussions we're gonna have. Um, and so Hadley and Corinne, you briefly touched on national standards in the overview. And I was just wondering if you wanted to provide some insights and highlights related to nat or national standards and their interpretation. So we're going to show to show some videos um, that we've created around national standards. We worked with a graphic recording um, artist on do some. He was able to listen to some of our presentations, and um, with the idea of graphic recording, we were able to put that into a video, um, which will be launching May fifth. But we thought we'd share some clips with you uh, to kind of give you that visual stimulation uh, along with the information. So there's two main parts of this law and the part that has gotten the most sort of media attention and attention is the inherent jurisdiction and that lawmaking and we are going to talk about this but we want to also talk about the other part of this law that's that's law right now um, and should be being applied which is the national standards and we see a lot of potential in the national standards first of all um, to make a difference um, in children's and families lives and second of all um, for uh, communities to 
be self-determining, um, to be making um, small steps and taking action right now. Um, not necessarily um, being able to do things that don't necessarily mean doing a, a full law or full jurisdiction, but just taking action um, within these national standards. And we'll point those out when we see them. So these national standards are in force right now. They apply to both federal and provincial governments. And what they do is set out a number of minimum standards related to child and family services delivery. Um, so uh, what that means is it doesn't displace the provincial act. That law is still in place. Um, but where this act, uh, there might be a conflict or the provincial law is inconsistent, what is said in this law applies in the province. So the best way to do this, this can seem um, confusing. So do you need two sets of laws in front of you to understand what children and families are entitled to? And I think the simpler way um, to do that is to start with these national standards. Um, think of these national standards as a door. And then if the province wants to come back and argue that things are inconsistent, then, um, or, or that they are already doing that with their laws, um, they, can, they can do that. But, but this, um, the national standards are the starting point now. And when, uh, when uh, nations um, are making their own child and family services law, it's not going to replace these standards. Um, although the laws may influence the interpretation of best interests of the child, and we'll spend a little more time on best interests of the child later on. So there's two main parts of There's two main parts of the oh. getting to the next slide on the PowerPoint after those uh, videos are sometimes is sometimes tricky. So we have more detailed information on the national standards um, in the video um, on our website. So I, I really encourage anybody that's not familiar with them um, to, to familiarize yourself with them. And a really broad overview, the national standards, again, they're minimum standards. So provinces are free to go above and beyond these standards um, as are Indigenous nations. Um, but in general, the national standards really focus and give a priority to preventative services. They're focusing on having Indigenous children staying within Indigenous families and within Indigenous communities. Um, ensuring that Indigenous governments and families have a say and a voice, talking about what is in the best interest of Indigenous children. Valuing that cultural continuity and ongoing lifelong relationships with family members, community, land, and territories. Um, so uh, sometimes we say the national standards can be summed up in three words, relationships, 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 which is also often going back to um, Cindy's first overview um, of the landscape of, of child welfare. Uh, within child welfare, that's what people say as well. Um, what, what do children need? Relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, and there's also ongoing reassessments to pay attention to the effects of services. So not, not um, a child goes into care and that's it. There's never another review. Um, but, and also, regularly reassessing for the possibility of reunification. And I, I want to point that uh, part of the act out because it's actually the only part of the act that doesn't include a caveat saying when, um, if in the best interest of the child, etc. cetera. Um, it simply is a must that these reassessments um, for possible reunification need to be happening. So there's several principles when interpreting and applying the act. Uh, and so best interest of the child is something that will always be kind of like that conscience on your shoulder, let it be your guide when working with the children. But the difference here, it's best interest of the indigenous child. Uh, so it's not better interest of a child that lives in West Edmonton, but it's best interest of an indigenous child. And that's understanding that there are some unique factors with Indigenous children in regards to their cultural 
and who they are as Indigenous people. And so that's something I think that is very key in this document. It also talks about cultural continuity and that it's essential for the well-being of children that they have that cultural continuity. Um, so they, ha they have to understand their culture, they have to know it, there has to be some continuity in their care. And so that's the next point, which is child and family services must not contribute to assimilation or cultural destruction. And why we put, why that was put into the legislation is just to remind people of the seriousness of this legislation and a reminder that we do have a high number of Indigenous children in care and some of them, um, many of them are there for various reasons and some of them can be because of these reasons. And to acknowledge what was done in the past with residential schools. Also substantive equality. The child, the child's family and the child's governing body must all be able to exercise their rights under this act. And so the difference for this now too is that with Indigenous children, it's not just First Nation, but this also includes Métis and Inuit children being able to exercise those rights and their governing bodies being able to exercise those rights that they didn't have before January 2020. And so that's something that's really important. And then also a jurisdictional dispute cannot result in a gap of services. So if they're fighting over who has jurisdiction of a child, that can, can they can have that conversation, but it must not result in a gap of services. The child's needs must be met immediately at the onset. And maybe I'll just jump in there that that, that jurisdictional gap, that's basically Jordan's principle. If you're familiar with Jordan's principle, this is, this is putting this into law. So, if we'll we'll focus on best interests of the child um, and best interests of the indigenous child because this really is a central legal principle um, that every single piece of legislation family law or um, child welfare law across canada and most of the world um, ends up focusing on and turning on um, so so this is quite important and often best interests of the child has been used as 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 corin alluded to in ways that that don't lead to good results for indigenous children um, in the long term or sometimes even the short term um, and there's been recognition of that and a lot of research done on that um, and and indigenous advocacy for for decades um, pointing this out so one thing in these national standards is is setting out that the best interests of the indigenous child requires a new analysis um, judges and decision makers can't keep doing the same old, same old here. One of the things that often happens with best interests of the child is there's a list of factors. And the judge will say, well, none of them are super weighted. Um, so therefore, I will basically do what I want to do. I'll pick the factor and say that this is in the best interest of the child. Well, this legislation does give a super weight to some factors. And the factors are the importance of the child's family relationships and community connections. So there's a primary consideration clause that sets out saying when considering the best interest factors, primary consideration must be given to the child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety, security, and well being. And keep in mind that that well being we already have, that cultural continuity is key to that well being. Then it goes on to say, as well as to the importance for that child of having an ongoing relationship with their family and with the Indigenous group, community, or people to which they belong, and of preserving the child's connections to their culture. So that's a super weight of those relationships and community and cultural connections. So some of the court, um, the court, it's been a year and a bit, almost a year and a half now since um, Bill C-92 has been in the courts and the national standards have been open to interpretation and the legislation has been open to interpretation to the judiciary. And so because there was not a lot of information coming out on Bill C-92, the interpretation across Canada has been very, <laughs> it's been very interesting and concerning. Um, and it really depends on the province that you're in and sometimes even on the level of judge um, 
to see where it's going. And man, many things have been on the floor level for judiciary. Um, and so seeing that it'll be interesting to watch some of these cases moving up. Uh, the law just were working on a, we're working on a full uh, case brief on all of the cases um, that will eventually be figuring out how to share with the public. Uh, so we've been watching very, some of them very closely. But I just wanted to kind of talk quickly about some of the ones that have kind of brought concern. And as we move into talking about the issues, um, these are issues that are of concern to us. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later on, but just to flag a few. So the first one is the SL, is an Alberta case. Uh, and there's two parts to the case. And so, but this case was brought to our attention by some of our friends working in the area. And they said, this case is, there's some issues going on with this case. And so one of them is, um, directly in the court case, you can see that the director for the agency stated um, that there is no such thing as Indigenous governing bodies, that they don't know what Indigenous governing bodies are. And so to most of us that work with Indigenous community, this seems like a silly interpretation. When we know Indigenous governing bodies are, and it's stated in the legislation that Indigenous governing are, at the very least, bands and First Nations. And they could be, Métis, they obviously would be Métis organizations and Inuit organizations. Anybody that is uh, exercising that Section 35 right and acting for a First Nation, um, so they do exist. They are, the reason why I think they called it Indigenous governing bodies in the legislation is to be all encompassing, to include all, remember we now we have all of these children that we're responsible for. And so now we have more organizations that are, should be at the table for representing all these children, but they might have different names, whether they are bands, Métis organization, national Inuit organizations, tribal councils, whatever it may be, they do have a place at the table. And so this indigenous governing bodies was to be all encompassing. But unfortunately, some people have taken that interpretation to limit and to, to, to limit the opportunity for indigenous people to come to the table. And so if we, if, if we were to pretend that we didn't know what they were, as some people are saying, they don't know what they are they, because it's not clearly defined in their own legislation um, or from their own government, um, then it's like, well, how do you give notice to these bodies? So how do we give notice? And it, interestingly enough, this case, um, there was three possible First Nations that could have been involved. There was one nation that was served, but it was if you look at the case, they were served about two days after the province of Alberta shut down. So we received notice on Sunday that everything was shutting down in Alberta. Apparently, this one of the First Nations was served uh, two days later. Um, I don't know about you, but a lot of our, our First Nations reserves, they went on lockdown. They put up blockades. Nobody was going to work. Uh, and so I'm, I'm con I am concerned about that because the nation didn't have opportunity to make representations. One, because who did they serve and what opportunity did they have to get to a lawyer? Uh, and so not only are we talking about what's an Indigenous governing body, whose responsibility is to give notice and interpreting that in the courts, we're also dealing with the fact that we're in COVID. <laughs> and so it did provide a lot of complications. So it'll be interesting to see if this moves up into court. There are a lot of interested parties in this, and there was possible three um, First Nation uh, governments that could have been involved. So it's one that a lot of people were concerned about. And another one is the British Columbia case. And it, a lot of cases across Canada have started to have conversations about party status. Uh, and this is concerning. Some are getting it right. Some are looking at the interpretation of the law and that parties should be added and expanding the definition of mom and dad and looking at the, our aunties and our uncles and grandparents and um, indigenous families. And what was the law made to when they interpret, broaden the definition of family. And so some are looking at how do we include that? And so, and then what is the rights of the foster parents in that case? As if you've been following cases in the South, in the United States, they've had different interpretations of that depending on the state that you're in. And so we're hoping that this doesn't happen in Canada, um, but I think that some of these will have to end up going to the superior level and having to set some precedent because these are the cases that are setting precedent for now, because it's all we have. So we'll see how this year rolls out. But that conversation about party status is being had in the court and they're going based on our interpretation of who's at the table and who's arguing it. The other one is placement. And so if you remember in the video that we saw, um, we talked about our Jiminy Cricket, our, he's, he's our conscious, we let it be our guide. So best interest of indigenous children. 
that's our conscious that's what's on our shoulder and so in here they have this con in the here on perth children aid society they have that conversation one there's the conversation about we must respect the federal legislation and we must consider it no it's federal legislation everybody it means federal what does federal mean it means paramount it means it's up here and as lawyers we all it's 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 not optional it's not maybe it's up here we follow it just like we're following the new divorce act so paramount legislation is really important but unfortunately it's still being interpreted while we have the provincial legislation no we have it's federal legislation and eventually we're going to have indigenous federal legislation that will have to be treated the same as federal law so we'll see how that also plays out but they're in this one they're having a conversation about what's the best importance is it best interest of the indigenous child or placement and how do we work through that and so there's some crackling uh, and so part of that is looking at how do we work these together how do we balance that conscious on our shoulder that best interest of the child and how do we work it with the placement priority system that is now must be followed within bill c92 and so they worked it out very and they looked at the cultural continuity but they were able to kind of have those conversations and the last one is identity and this is because there's now that we have this opportunity to do reassessments which is available in the law, we have the opportunity to reassess. That includes finding out if children have Métis, non-status Inuit or First Nations identity. And so the, at this point, there was the foster family was saying, no, you can't decide that they're Métis today. Uh, you can't, just because you found out they're Métis today, that doesn't apply. Um, you, the, so this law doesn't apply. But it, Thankfully, the agency was able to push through and say, no, actually, we it does apply. They're Métis. Now we are going to follow Bill C-92. We've been able to make connections. We've been able to find an aunt. So we're going to be possibly looking at placements to honor Bill C-92 and follow that law. And so, and the judge agreed. And the, one of the things the judge said is that identity is fluid. And if upon reassessment, you find that a child has uh, indigenous identity, then that identity must be honored. And identity is fluid. And it doesn't, just because if they came into care and the identity was unknown at that time, it doesn't get treated unknown. You continue to do again, what is the best interest of that indigenous child? So it'll be interesting to see where some of these cases go forward. And we're always interesting at, at the Lodge to hear about some of the cases going forward. Um, and if there's any way that we can uh, just provide some insight into those. Cindy, did you want to take the time to touch on Canada's use of Bill C-92 and their litigation efforts? Yeah, sure. I think that's the next slide, Shelby. And um, as as many of you know, uh, when it comes to individual cases as are heard in provincial court, uh, we're in federal court on the Caring Society and AFN case against Canada on their inequitable provision of First Nations child welfare. Now, the even before uh, what I'm gonna call C92, because that name is just a mouthful for me, <laughs> uh, even before C92 became law, Canada actually applied for a judicial review of a tribunal order, ordering it to compensate the children and the families who are affected by Canada's longstanding discrimination in the inequitable provision of First Nations Child and Family Services, but also because of Canada's improper definition of Jordan's principle. In September of 2019, the federal, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found that Canada's discrimination against these people was willful and reckless and a worst case scenario, quoting the tribunal. And it was a worst case scenario. We saw exhibits from the government's own documents of children who had tragically died waiting, or they had waited so long for services that they became adults and Canada then said, well, the case is resolved because they're no longer a child. Um, and of course we have the multiple families being separated because of inequitable provision, particularly of prevention services, but not just that alone, also because of the inequalities in the other public services that we talked about earlier. So Canada um, in the tribunal's order for compensation comes out in September 2019. In October, in the midst of the federal election, the federal government applies for judicial review. And it says, we don't want to pay any compensation to these people. 
And it actually, for the first time, cites C-92 even before it became law. And their use of it was to defend the Crown against paying any compensation to these people. Uh, there's now, however, uh, been a second judicial review, and that's regarding Jordan's principle. In November of 2020, and both of these are going on at the same time, just to keep you posted, we'll get more detail later. But in November of 2020, we were successful in receiving a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order that required the federal state to provide Jordan's principle to non-status First Nations children off reserve who are recognized by their nations. Just a few days before Christmas 2020, the federal government seeks a second judicial review and it wants to quash that order. Um, and this is actually, um, we're now ramping up to hear both judicial reviews in June. Uh, but this is actually a quote from their uh, factum, which is their legal submission from the government of Canada. And I thought you might be interested in just seeing how they're applying it. So it said the tribunal avoided addressing the problems it created and the difficult issues of community recognition and the second generation cutoff, that being the Indian Act, by instructing the parties to devise a system themselves. And that system, from our point of view, was that First Nations recognize their members. It did try to mitigate the scope by holding that uh, Jordan's uh, uh, First Nations decision on a community recognition was limited to Jordan's principle context, but that reasoning per, uh, presumes without evidence that First Nations are content to decide that a person can be a member of their community for some purposes, but not for others. It disregards possible spillover precedential effects of creating definitions that conflict with those used in other contexts and other statutes, including the exercise of jurisdiction over child and family services recently affirmed by the uh, Act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families. The tribunal's reasoning is fraught with problems and incapable of meeting the standard of rationality that Vazavlov demands. Now, what I'm calling your attention to here is what they want is they want the Indian Act to apply, their own piece of federal legislation. That's what they say is the, should be the decision maker on whether people access Jordan's principle. We're saying much more in alignment with what our, my interpretation of C-92, that no, it is not that colonial Indian Act that rules the day. It is First Nations self-determination about who receives those services. Now, this is a very important uh, judicial review in my view, because what we're testing here is whether Canada is serious about respecting First Nations determination of citizenship on and off reserve. And here we see an example of where the federal government in its legal submissions is trying to use the act to aggress against the rights of First Nations children. Um, this will be an important case to follow. It'll be heard the week of June 14th uh, to the 18th and we're hoping it'll be webcast so that you can be able to follow along. So important as Corin is saying is to watch those cases in the provincial system but don't lose sight on how the federal government is deploying this act uh, in the defense of itself. And in this case, at least in my view, as a mechanism to violate the rights of First Nations children. And we're just gonna be moving on to the next section. And I just would like to note that the interjurisdictional nature of providing services to First Nation, Métis and Inuit people consistently causes neglect, confusion and challenges. Corinne and Hadley, did you want to start and take some time expanding on constitutional challenges related to the provision of services to First Nation, Métis and Inuit children and families? and any proceedings related to the constitutionality of providing services, providing these services. Thanks for that, Shelby, and feel free to jump in too, because I think you would probably have something to add here <laughs> um, from your experience. Um, but it, as, as Shelby talked about, there, there's really a long history 
not in, in all essential services, so not just in child welfare. And we see some of the questions we're going to, we'll answer some of those questions in the, in the question and answer, um, but a lot of them are around the realities of funding, um, which, which is, is, is what uh, Cindy is pointing out here. Um, there's a long history in Canada um, where the federal and provincial governments argue over who should not be responsible for funding um, essential services for Indigenous people. There is, there's a long history with First Nations. Um, there's also a long history that that's part of what the Daniels case was about. Um, not necessarily, um, they didn't necessarily find the responsibility, but, but the argument from the federal government was that uh, they, they did not have any responsibility over um, Métis or, or non-status. Um, so there's a long history of federal and provincial governments putting their efforts there. Um, and um, as Shelby alluded to, um, the, the, the National Inquiry fi final report termed a phrase interjurisdictional neglect to capture sort of this cavernous gap um, that Indigenous peoples find themselves in time and time again, where these arguments are happening about who shouldn't fund essential services. Um, that is, um, and, and um, Cindy's much better verse, so I'm going to allow her to speak to this more. That's what's behind Jordan's principle. Um, and as, as Cindy alluded to, real people and living and dying in this gap. Um, that's um, the essence of the Caring Society case, um, this um, arguing over who should and shouldn't fund. Um, Naomi Metallic has a, has a great paper talking about the need for seeing self-government is actually a human right um, based on the findings um, of the Caring Society case that I can highly recommend. Then we get to the Quebec reference case. So right now, the government of Quebec brought a reference question to the Quebec Court of Appeal saying, we don't think the federal government had, was acting properly in its power um, to enact Bill C-92, to enact this, this act over Indigenous child and family services. I, I won't go into the details of that case um, because uh, division of powers and paramountcy are, are legal issues that uh, get lawyers excited and everybody else eyes place over. Um, but I think what I wanna really highlight there is here we have a switch. So um, Quebec is arguing that they should have the power over um, indigenous children and families based on their provincial power and that the federal government shouldn't have that power. So just paying attention to the difference, once we have an act set out that is recognizing jurisdiction, um, that there's this argument saying, no, we should have the power, which is the opposite of what um, is this long history of saying, we don't wanna take responsibility. We don't want to, um, uh, because responsibility and power are, are of course linked. So I wanted to highlight that. I also, um, without going into detail on that case, just want to highlight that one of the things that's really striking about Quebec's arguments in that case is there was virtually nothing about Indigenous children, families, or governments in their arguments. Their arguments are about who should have power over Indigenous children and family, federal government or provincial governments. So there's that um, complete erasure of um, indigenous governments um, and what's actually happening on the ground, which they're saying isn't relevant at all. Um, so brief overview of that's ongoing, that's gonna be heard in September, 2021. Um, we'll, we'll see what, what comes of that and, and whether it will go up to the Supreme Court or whether it will be settled um, at that level. The act still applies and the act should still be being applied in Quebec. And if I can take a moment and there's a, there's a question in the, in the question and answer about this too. Um, judges absolutely need to be applying this law. Um, we're, we're aware that, that maybe some judges are not. Um, however, they should be. Um, again, as Corin said, this, this is law and it's law in Quebec right now. Um, this law is not on hold because of this reference case. And Corin, I don't know if you wanna comment 
um, a little bit on, on the challenges to ICWA, which is the, the US equivalent of this act. Um, yeah, so in the States, um, they have ICWA, which is their indigenous, uh, they have their own national child welfare law for indigenous people. Um, and they have a national organization, um, but they've been in this for 40 years. So we kind of look to them to see kind of what is the possibility of our future. And they have a lot more, uh, because they're several many years in, they have a lot more different opportunities and supports for communities and um, connecting. Uh, but they have a yearly conference. And so this year they talk there and they usually send out case briefs about what some of the cases that are going through. And there's been a lot of cases um, in the U.S. that have ca ca caused concern about ICWA. And so the latest one has been this Brackeen versus Holland. And it's the one they call it the one big ICWA case challenge because it does question the constitutionality of ICWA. And so depending on because of the states in their court system, it's very it's a little different than Canada. Uh, it's a, a lot more complicated than Canada. But there there is some oppor some opportunities um, depending on if your case is in Texas, Louisiana or Mississippi, if you're then it does mean that your uh, rights will be very different than if it, you were in a state that was not involved. But the big thing is that they're challenging, again, that constitutionality of ICWA as a national law. And again, who has the power? Is it the, the states or is it the federal government? Is it indigenous communities? And so constantly having these arguments about power and legislation. Um, and so we're hoping that, that those type of thing, this, that type of thing does not happen in Canada. Um, again, it could affect us differently just based on our, our laws around paramountcy and um, case law, but it's something to watch out for and there, but there's lots of positive things to look out for. They have active efforts in the states, whereas here we have reasonable efforts, uh, which is something that's very different. Um, and so, but it's something that's just to keep an eye out that we're, con we're constantly having to have these uh, conversations about power and jurisdiction and children but it's when, when it comes down to money then there's like no 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 but we will have the power we just won't give the money <laughs> and so it's kind of like it's a it's a it's it tends to be you can have some of this but not all of this so it does cause a lot of challenges for communities and for people Yeah, and it's a it's very important to acknowledge kind of that interjurisdictional neglect that is experienced in child and family services as well as elsewhere, just because people fall through the gaps and then they're not their needs are not being met. And uh, it's a really important challenge to think about uh, moving forward. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, for Hadley and Corin to take the time to discuss highlights, emerging issues and internal issues related to jurisdiction. So again, we're just gonna show another video. So the other part of this act is the inherent jurisdiction part of the act. And this is the lawmaking. And, and I mean, this is, this is a huge endeavor, um, but it's, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because the act is actually pretty um, simple. Uh, the work is not necessarily that simple. Um, but this is, this is a huge historic part of this act and um, it shouldn't be underestimated. It, so again, it recognizes and affirms as a section 35 right, the inherent right of self-government and that this inherent right of self-government includes jurisdiction in relation to child and family services. This is so huge because really there, there's so much harm um, that has been done by non-Indigenous governments to Indigenous children and families um, for decades, for, for centuries here in Canada. And if you really get to the root of that, um, what's the cause of all of this? The cause is really not recognizing this inherent jurisdiction, um, not affirming and respecting the fact that Indigenous peoples uh, have the authority to make decisions about Indigenous children and families like every other society. 
So, so once again, like the national standards, um, there are materials that will break this down more, but just to give an overview of, of what the Act is saying about jurisdiction. Um, one really important part here is the Act does not give jurisdiction to Indigenous governing bodies. It recognizes inherent jurisdiction. Um, and it recognizes it as a Section 35 Aboriginal or treaty right. That has implications because there are court cases that say the government can regulate and justifiably infringe on Section 35 rights. Um, and the rest of the act is really, um, the rest of the jurisdiction section is really the government, um, the federal government saying, here's how we're, we're choosing to regulate that, right? And here's what you need to do if you want to have your Indigenous law recognized and having the power and force of federal law. Um, one of the things to really stress here is exercising jurisdiction is not all or nothing. And we are hearing that so often when we're talking to communities. And I think just um, people um, in from, from the federal or provincial governments as well. This, there's nothing in this act that says you cannot draft anything unless you are prepared and have the capacity and, and want to take over every single aspect of lawmaking and administration of children's services. That's not what this act says. It's not all or nothing. It, it recognizes that jurisdiction includes a power to write laws. All governments write laws and they amend laws. So if you are lawmaking, you could decide to write one provision. Um, you could decide to make your own minimum standards like the national standards saying, here are the standards that apply to our children. Um, or here's our definitions, um, or you can develop a full act. And the majority of what we've seen out there are, are uh, Indigenous governing bodies developing a, a full act. But we just want to stress that's not actually necessary. You really could do one or two provisions, or you really could do your own minimum standards. Um, it goes on to say, and you can administer services. So just again, stressing, there's a difference between making laws um, or setting out your own minimum standards and taking on the entire administration of child and family services. Um, so you could decide that you aren't going to draft your law. You're, you, you would be fine with the provincial law in place or, or C92 as written, as long as um, your, you have your people administrating this law, you could decide that. Um, or you could decide again both. Um, you could decide that you're going to administer prevention and you may want to take on a fuller administration later. Um, and the other part is, is saying, and you could develop your own dispute resolution processes. Um, so again, this could be totally separate. It could be the only thing people do. Or or um, Indigenous groups could decide to do all three of these things and, and have, have the whole um, from, from sort of start to finish, um, from lawmaking to dispute resolution um, in their own hands. But, but we've, we have uh, given talks and, and had conversations with First Nations that are saying, you know, we think actually if we develop our own dispute resolution process, we've had some success you know, in criminal justice, and we have some capacity there, we think if we have our own dispute resolution uh, process, that might address some of our most pressing issues. And that's what we're going to focus on right now. So just really wanting to stress that because there's, there's uh, some growing misconceptions out there that are having people stop before they start. It's not all or nothing. Um, again, the act sets out a process if you want to have your law recognized as federal law, um, which would mean that your law prevails over provincial law. Again, it's not a suggestion. You're not policy making, although you may also policy make. You would be drafting a law that is going to trump provincial law if it is different and it's in the best interest of the child. Um, again, there's that regulation, um, so it sets out a process um, for recognition. Um, you need to give notice um, to federal and provincial governments. You need to try to negotiate a coordination agreement. There's a time frame on the coordination agreement. That's not a timeline on Indigenous governing bodies. That's a timeline on the federal and provincial governments to respond in a reasonable way. So, if you're making reasonable efforts, that timeline's on them, not, not on you. 
Um, you need to be willing to publish your law on a website, um, follow certain of the national standards and the charter and the, the Canadian Human Rights Act apply. Um, and again, there's um, the biggest gap that we see here with the jurisdiction is that no funding guarantees or framework. Um, so emerging issues that we're seeing with jurisdiction um, and, and credit to people that got Canada's technical package out. I think it came out December 29th, um, 2019 or something. I think people are probably working over the holidays. Um, but just to really stress that we're, we're seeing communities take that technical package and say, oh, this must be the law, we have to follow this. And it may make sense diplomatically to follow that um, if you're sitting at a table with Canada. But we, we just wanna highlight that it that technical package provides Canada's interpretation of the act. It's not the law, it's not what the act is saying. And some of the things in that technical package we think um, isn't necessarily the best interpretation of, of this act. Um, it's, it's not necessarily the interpretation that is going to allow this act to have its full purpose and effect, which is what you look for in interpretation. Um, there's some concerns about, we know individual nations are being asked to sign confidentiality agreements. And so they're not, um, if they're wanting to sit at a negotiation table, they're not, uh, they're, they're being told they can't discuss what's going on there with other indigenous nations. Um, we see this as a huge concern. Um, because obviously, if people are able to talk to each other, um, that that wealth of knowledge and experience um, can be shared with one another. Um, so uh, often, often you can hear in sort of stereotypical discourse, oh, you know, if, if only First Nations work together. Um, but in the meantime, you have these uh, confidentiality agreements that are essentially saying you can't work together. Um, you can't share this essential information. Um, to figure out uh, how to build on each other's strengths. Um, we're hearing uh, some cases where Canada is telling nations they must have a delegated agency to proceed or to receive any funding. Um, we're also hearing the opposite, that absolutely no funding can go to delegated agencies, even where a First Nation is, is wanting their delegate, delegated agency to lead this work. Um, but just again to highlight, and, and I won't beat that dead horse to death, but just that all or nothing thing again, um, lawmaking is not the same as administering services. Um, they, they're separate things. So, so legally, uh, based on my interpretation of this act, th there shouldn't be a reason that you need to have a delegated agency set up um, before you go about that lawmaking process. Um, uh, I mean, Corinth talked about some provinces who are claiming they're denying they know what an Indigenous governing body is or um, that, that no Indigenous governing bodies exist in a province despite there being many First Nations who they um, continually uh, do uh, consultation and accommodation with in other areas. Um, the, the funding, um, again, uh, can't stress this enough that this seems to always be coming back to this issue. Um, it, we're not seeing it being transparent, um, consistent or available to everybody. I know um, there, there's a more recent discussion around that, but, but we're hearing really uneven things about that. Um, and then as, as Cindy referred to, or, or we'll speak about a bit more later, um, it's unclear um, if Canada considers itself still bound by the Caring Society order um, once a nation has exercised jurisdiction under the Act. So um, that's obviously um, a concern for, for equity, for the well being of First Nations children. So some of the internal issues around jurisdiction that we've been hearing, um, again, um, that do we have to do everything or do we not? And it, it's important to think about what works best for your community and not let that be influenced by what works best for uh, the federal government or the provincial government, because at the end of the day, this is about you and what's in the best interest of your Indigenous children. Um, and the other thing to think about is how do we make laws and community engagement in a pandemic? This is a real reality for people. Um, 
um, whether you, like it's not, not everybody has access to internet or Zoom. Um, and so how do we even have those conversations with the feds? How do we even have those conversations with our community during a pandemic? And so recognizing that we're in a pandemic and whatever speed works for your community, works for your community and don't feel the rush to do what you need to do, take care of the things that need to be taken care of. And a lot of us need to focus on that pandemic mode. So um, it's not, there's no race. There's the, there's no prize at the end for who gets their law first. It's just doing again, what's in the best interest of you. And that's going to look very differently all across Canada with all of our indigenous communities, uh, the lack of funding and competing priorities. So we have funding or how do we go to the table and get funding for this for child welfare? Or do we go to the table and get funding to ensure clean water? And so a lot of our leadership are spread pretty thin in the per, in, in the work that they have to do because there's a lot of issues. And then also, then you have this other thing on the side, which is the pandemic. So again, uh, just the understanding and realizing the realities that many of our indigenous communities are in. And then identify and implementing what models work for you and looking at your own legal principles and processes for your community. And so some of the work that we do at the lodge is working with communities and developing their own uh, law based on their own legal principles. And some, some communities have looked to the provinces or looked to other communities to see what uh, models work for them and try to see what works best for them. And so, but really say, taking a look at what is internal, what comes from within your community to be able to do, to do that work and what is, what are your values and those I, they, they should look very different. What's the best interest of a Haida child might be, will likely be very different from a Mi'kmaq child to a, a Mohawk to a Cree child based on our principles and values and our own ideas around kinship um, and traditional laws. Um, and the other conversation is around that stronger ties provision into legislation. There was some communities that said, well, we don't know what to do if there's a child from say, uh, two different reserves, or maybe even two different Indigenous communities, we don't know what to do. Well, remember, we all had ways of knowing and being and interacting, and we had ways of diplomacy when we interacted with other nations. And so I see those starting to, to come to the surface. And we've heard of some communities saying, we're not going to let the province or the feds decide who has the stronger tires. We're going to work with our community partners and other Indigenous communities around us. And we're going to create our own internal dialogue about what happens if our children are from both communities. And we're going to be able to work that on our own. And many communities already do that, dealing with things like marriage and membership and those type of things. So it's just about having those conversations. And you can even create your own agreements um, between each other moving forward. And then having those courageous conversations within communities, uh, child welfare isn't a fun conversation for a lot of communities. It brings up a lot of emotions. It brings up a lot of um, hard emotions. And so being able to have those conversations with your community, to, but also to be able to say, if we're gonna be taking on our own uh, jurisdiction and all of those things, and we also have some work to do in our community. It's not just about leadership and boards moving forward. It needs to be an all thing because now if we look at these displacement priority from going from mom and dad to brother, sister, aunt or uncle to other indigenous people in your community, now there's this more opportunity for people to be involved. And so that's gonna be an opportunity to say, look, this is a thing we wanna make sure that when CFS is having to go through that placement period, that there's opportunities at all levels for all children. And are we ready in our community for those opportunities? And what can we do in our communities to support that? Um, because there isn't funding to create those support systems. Um, and so it's something to think about and how we're going to have those conversations means how are we going to take back jurisdiction and exercise jurisdiction and control for the best interest of our children. Great, thanks for that. Um, and just part of the work I've been working on with Dr. Friedland and Professor Naomi Metallic on accountability kind of really connects with this this need to find equity because we're we're trying to come up with different models on how we can make sure that equity is realized and thinking about how we can you know, hold the governments accountable to making sure that they provide services in the equitable way. And so just to start off with this topic, I wanted to ask um, each panelist to maybe um, give me, give us a, just a brief description on what does equity mean and what does it look like to you 
at least or particularly in the provision of child and family services. Maybe maybe I'll go first because um, I, 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 I have a feeling I know, Cindy, what, what you will focus on. So I think I'm just going to focus on the equity. Um, as I referred to briefly, Professor Metallic's uh, article on, on saying there's an implication within the Caring Society decision that self-determination um, is necessary for human rights. And so for, for me, um, part, a, a really important starting point in equity is that equitable, um, again, just really simple, each, every society, in every society, the family is a core societal institution. Um, and Indigenous nations, Inuit, First Nation, Métis, so-called non-status, um, have that, 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 that to me is a starting point for equity, um, is where that is, is recognized, that self-determination, that lawmaking, um, and that deep knowledge within each society of what children within that society need to become healthy, flourishing adults um, as part of that society. Maybe I'll let Corin go first, because then I'll uh, I'll take a stab at it. So mine is just equal opportunity. Uh, having the opportunity to be at the table is uh, equity, and everybody's and acknowledge that every in order for everybody to get to the table, it's a very different route, and there's very different obstacles. Whereas some, it just might be easy to turn on your computer and say log on with the federal government that is not the case for everybody uh, across Canada. So ensuring that there's equal opportunity to get to the table and that acknowledging that everybody's journey is very different based on their resources that they have available to them. For me, um, we deal a lot with substantive equality. And what that means is that we have to deal with the inequalities that have been created due to colonial types of policies over the years. So that First Nations, Métis and Inuit children are not starting at the same place as non-Indigenous children because of the experiences, both historical and contemporary of colonialism. So one of the things I like to say pe to people, um, what substantive equality is not is the equal treatment of unequals. Uh, when you, uh, that is from a 1955 Supreme Court decision from the United States. So I give credit to that phrase, but, uh, you can't just all of a sudden, for example, in this last budget, announce childcare across the board without dealing with the significant gaps in First Nations childcare uh, that have been existing for years. And so those are examples of how the equal treatment of unequals actually doesn't do anything about the gap. It just continues the gap and in some cases broadens it. It's also, I think, in this context, very interesting. And I look forward to kind of hearing more from Hadley and Corn on this, but C92, in my view, is not the only way to affirm your, your jurisdiction in child welfare. Uh, you could, in fact, go under Section 35, or you could, uh, for self-governing First Nations, actually draw down your authority and self-governing agreements. The problem, though, and I think this is a major challenge, is up until this point, the feds aren't prepared to give you any funding unless you go down the C92 route. And that kind of raises a bit of kind of concern for me about what they're trying to do. The other thing is it's important on equity is access to justice. So we heard about the standards and we heard about the placement principles and all the rest of it. Uh, but if you're a family or a community and uh, you're feeling that the law is not being followed, how do you actually, are you able to kind of take that on? And uh, for me, I, I just run a little nonprofit called the Caring Society. Many of you are familiar with it and Corin's on our board and we're so grateful she is. But we have had the firsthand experience of trying to hold a government accountable for its uh, inequitable treatment for First Nations children, along with the Assembly of First Nations. That, care, that case is now in its 14th year. Uh, the federal government has spent over $10 million just on legal fees litigating against that. So the whole question of access to justice, access to be able to make this a reality in the lives of kids, to me is part of that equation on equity. <laughs> 
Great, thank you guys. Um, so the next slide or the next part uh, will be Cindy providing more context on what's occurring in practice in terms of equity. And um, she's gonna give us a lot more context with respect to that. Yeah, one of the things I think that we really need to be aware of is equity is self-determination. It really worries me when I hear a government say, oh, well, draw down your own law and we'll figure out the money later. And in fact, that's what we heard from the federal government in uh, regarding C-92. That's highly problematic because what you end up with is your own law, but no ability to be able to enact that law. And uh, that, that leaves your community members in kind of a jurisdictional no man's land. And it also leaves you with a, uh, a problem about how do you then uh, negotiate after you've drawn down your own authority, who do you hold accountable for the funding? Because as Hadley and Korn have pointed out, there's no provisions in the act that require either the federal or provincial governments to fund you. Now, the re reason uh, that I, we started out kind of talking about what drives uh, First Nations children into care, and I need to emphasize that's First Nations data. So when you hear 12 times more likely to go into child welfare care and the drivers being poverty, poor housing, domestic violence, uh, those are based on First Nations analysis of data. One of the big gaps we have in the country is a national child welfare data system. So we can speak to what is actually happening for First Nations, Métis and Inuit children writ large. What we do know is very good evidence is that the greater the inequalities in any uh, society, so if we say First Nations versus uh, other Canadians, um, the poorer the outcomes are gonna be for kids across the board. So if you don't have clean water, if you don't have, have overcrowded housing, for in, inequities in education, inequities in early childhood, inequities in maternal, health, inequities in um, juvenile justice, all of those inequalities are going to mean that your families and your children are going to be overrepresented on every factor that you don't want to be overrepresented on and underrepresented in the areas that you do want to be uh, overrepresented on, like things like education success, etc. So the, the magic bullet that we have is actually equal, equity. Equity has to be in place in order for children and families to achieve good outcomes, not just as children and families, but across their life course. And in fact, thanks to the work of Amy Bombay and other researchers, we know that uh, the, these types of the hardships of inequality actually can affect future generations downstream. So this is the primary piece. And I'm just showing you a report here that documents all the evidence around that, that paid particular attention to uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit in Canada and other Indigenous peoples across the Americas. Next slide, please. So I just wanna give you a sense of how big of a driver poverty is. So if say, if you drew down your child welfare law, but you didn't deal with the inequities in, that result in the impoverishment of families in your community, well, this is a longitudinal study that was done in the U.S. So when we say $100 a U, uh, there, it actually should be a U.S. $100 bill, but we have a picture of a Canadian one. Uh, what they did is they had a large sample of 13,000 uh, families, and that half of this group got an additional $100 a year. So that's hardly anything. Uh, but uh, if the, by providing that $100 a year, the substantiated child welfare reports go down by 10%. So if you build a child welfare law, but you don't deal with the conditions of poverty, you're likely going to see that the, the, the factors putting kids at risk are gonna continue. And you can see here through this study, there are many others that show that tight correlation between poverty and between child welfare intervention. Next slide. That's one of my critiques actually of C92 is that I think it takes on a very narrow view of, uh, of child welfare. I, I don't know if a First Nation that has a child welfare law. We have clan laws and children's laws that are interdependent that would don't parse out things like poverty from the real world. Um, the other thing I just wanna show you, and this is a thing that we don't often think about is the voluntary sector and its services to First Nations. So we all know about the inequalities in federal services on reserve, 
But it's made even worse by the fact that we don't have the same kind of voluntary sector or nonprofit sector services that uh, non-Indigenous folks have off reserve. Things like food banks, uh, shelters, recreation programs, cultural programs that are funded via donations or, and this is an important piece, by the federal and provincial governments. The federal and provincial governments are huge funders of what's called this nonprofit or voluntary sector. And that along with government funding and the corporate sector filled the building blocks of what children and families can benefit off reserve. But on reserve, you get these broad sweeping inequalities. Then you get negligible funding for the voluntary sector and then your corporate ability to kind of develop your own corporate structures limited to the Indian Act. So you need to pay attention to this nonprofit sector and I'll show you how big it is in, in the next slide. Next slide, please. So this is a group called Imagine Canada. They're a consortium uh, that looks after nonprofits and voluntary sector organizations. Uh, in First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit country, these are often PTOs, uh, nonprofit groups that get the direct uh, government funding for operations. But very rarely do we have things that are uh, government funded voluntary sector supports within community. If you look at the amount of money that we're talking about here, it's uh, for transfers from the federal government alone, it's about 20.8 billion rising as they project uh, by 2026 to about 39.7 billion dollars. These are substantial monies. And I often wonder if this is part of what is being taken into uh, account when people are negotiating funding agreements on C92 or any other factor, because this is public money, not exclusively, you'll see here that there's membership, sales of goods and services and that kind of thing. But a large portion of this non-voluntary sector is actually direct government money. And First Nations, I don't think, are seeing that reflected in the funding agreements, those gaps. Next slide. So here are the, re <laughs> here's the thing, you know, I, I want to believe that the federal and provincial governments are going to step up in the plate and um, address this. In fact, I used to believe that. I used to believe that if we documented the inequalities and the harms to children of those inequalities and provided evidence and form solutions, the federal government would address those problems, particularly on the heels of residential schools. I used to believe that very strongly, which is why I, I was a part of working with other First Nations experts on the two reports that you're seeing on the screen. The first one, the Joint National Policy Review with Canada. The second is done in 2005, and that was the Wande series of reports. Both documented the gross inequalities in federal funding for First Nations Child and Family Services. The, uh, what we call a National Policy Review, or NPR for short in 2000, found a 22% gap in services and particularly, particularly in prevention services to keep kids and their families. By 2005, that had grown to 30%. And you see, even after we launched our case, which was in 2007, the Auditor General comes out and says that the new, uh, are all the funding arrangements by the federal government for child and family for First Nations are inequitable. That still wasn't enough. The federal government continued to litigate against us. And I think it's really important to understand this history when you're sitting at the table and you're trying to negotiate funding with them or with the provinces and territories. Because in the midst of this, the provinces and territories, some of them were sending letters to the feds acknowledging that there was a two-tiered uh, child welfare system in their provinces, one that was provincially funded for everybody off reserve, and then the First Nations one, which was funded to a far lesser standard than everybody else but the provinces weren't gonna step in to cover that shortfall. And Quebec, interestingly, which is one of the province, which is the province launching the constitutional challenge against uh, the C-92, it actually took the position that there were no Jordan's principal cases. It wasn't needed in Quebec because we have our own arrangements. Well, that would have been news to the many First Nations families in Quebec who are now receiving help for Jordan's principal and ought to have received help before that date. 
So next slide. So uh, I'm gonna fast forward. We had a successful case. Uh, you know, everyone knows that the kids won the case in 2016. Canada was ordered to stop, but they didn't stop. So we've actually had, I think, I lose count sometimes, but I think we're about 18 non-compliance and procedural orders uh, so far, and the case is still going on in the government uh, in the in the tribunal. But one thing we're finding about Jordan's principle is that the vast majority of the cases, both individual and group cases, are actually just formal equality. It's just meeting what other kids would otherwise get without even having to make an application to Jordan's principle. So if you draw down jurisdiction without those gaps being clearly dealt with, I worry about what's going to happen for the children receiving these formal equality services. That's why the spirit barrier plan is so important. It's addressed. It let's deal with the inequalities and the gaps of all these services because we're seeing here with Jordan's principle, the vast majority of the 800,000 services and products approved to date are things that other kids don't have to apply for. Next slide. So we're back at a judicial reuse, and this is where Canada uh, is uh, taking First Nations kids to court. So even although it will uh, now often make statements that are favorable to Jordan's principle and indeed to the additional uh, investments they've had been forced to make by the Tribunal for Child and Family, um, they're actually actively litigating against us again. And so there's this whole hearing on compensation. The reason uh, that I think this is important to the discussion on C92 is it has to deal with the mindset, in my view, principally of where the federal state is at. They, they refuse to acknowledge that they were willfully and recklessly discriminating against these kids. They acknowledge, sure, that they knew about the inequalities, they can't get away from the fact that their own document said that linked it to the deaths of children. They can't get away from the fact that even their non-compliance order linked their non-compliance to the deaths of some children. But they're still saying, no, that's not willful and reckless. Just because we knew and just because children died or were hurt, that doesn't make us legally responsible and we ought to pay nothing. And what they're saying here, which is also equally uh, frightening to me, is that because this is a systemic case, there aren't individual victims that ought to be awarded compensation. Now think about that in the context of the George Floyd situation we're seeing, the tragedies of Native American and Black persons in the US uh, being subject to uh, police violence. If we only looked at it as one case, and we said, well, George is just a symbol of all the systemic discrimination that you sure might be happening. In fact, we know it's happening. We even have a legal ruling saying it is happening, but he ought not to be receiving any uh, compensation because he's an individual victim. It is just mind boggling, but that in fact is, I think, a, uh, the argument that the government of Canada is putting forward. Next slide. So here we are in Jordan's principle. This is the case I was talking to you about, uh, the one where Canada wants to restrict access to uh, for Jordan's principle to First Nations kids with Indian Act status. Um, the parties in it are the Assembly of First Nations, the Caring Society, Chiefs of Ontario, Anishinaabe Aski Nation, Amnesty International, and uh, recently, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples applied for and re received intervener status. So we're all going to go to court on this on June 14th to the 18th, 2021. And this deals with that issue of citizenship we talked about, right? So this is very important to be watching if you're one of those nations thinking, well, uh, we have jurisdiction over all our children. Because what Canada is saying is really, I think gets to what uh, Hadley and Corp were saying earlier, is sure you might have jurisdiction, but we don't wanna pay for it. Next slide. So this is actually a paragraph from Canada's uh, factum in submission for the federal court. And I think that this really gets at that where their mindset is. Even accepting the underfunding was a contributing factor to adverse outcomes for First Nations children. It was not the only factor in complex situations and was not wanton and heedless. 
changes to the flawed system were already underway when the tribunal ruled. That's what the Auditor General, by the way, found to be inequitable back in 2008. Then further changes were made specifically address the matters identified by the tribunal. There's no doubt the program could have and should have been reformed sooner, but there's no deliberate attempt to ignore the needs of First Nations children. By ignoring previous case law and failing to recognize the particular nature of the complaint, the tribunal's reasoning regarding willful and reckless again fails to meet the regular standards. So here we have the federal government not saying, okay, we did these things, but we shouldn't be held accountable for them. And in the midst of this, and I want you to just remember, C-92 starts to get rolled out right in the middle uh, after they were forced to pay uh, well over a billion dollars more per annum for First Nations children. Then all of a sudden they think affirming First Nations jurisdiction is important and they deliberately craft the law so there's no funding obligation on, this, on the federal state. That's something you just need to be aware of if you're stepping into this space. Next slide. So uh, the question is, what are the orders uh, for the tribunal going to apply? And as Hadley pointed out earlier, it's not entirely clear, but it's becoming clearer. And this is uh, through our ongoing litigation. Uh, this is Canada's response. And what they're saying is that there is no funding stream for the long-term operationalization of an Indigenous governing body's law once they begin jurisdiction. Uh, what we're feeling is that they view the First Nations Child and Family Service funding as just that for provincially delegated agencies. If you take down your own jurisdiction, you're going to have to negotiate something else. And then the question becomes, and this is a good question for Hadley and for Corn to answer, is how do you enforce that? Uh, would you be able to leverage these orders at all? I say yes, because the act in, in Greens, the Canadian Human Rights Act, which is the what these orders are based on. But I do uh, suspect that it would take litigation and perhaps very long litigation to resolve it. Next slide. All right. I think my uh, black bear friend here and I think it's time to hear from the panelists about some strategies or ways to move forward with C92 and improving the delivery of services and well being of First Nation, Metis, and Inuit children and families. So we just wanted to leave with a couple um, strategies for people moving forward and to think about in the work that you're doing. And again, the slides will be available um, after the session and um, we'll make sure we send them out. Uh, so basically in that th three strategies for First Nation is let the government know, uh, let them know that yes, you are in fact an indigenous governing body uh, and that you, and that you even if you don't want to, you don't have to give notice uh, that you're intending, but you can at least send a notice and say, look, just a heads up or a reminder, we are indigenous governing body. In case you didn't know, here's our contact information. And, and there you go. Um, representing your children whenever possible. I know funding is a factor, but working together with some other organizations and hopefully being able to be that voice for children and families when they need to. And then exercising that self-determination by self-defining and taking a look at um, your own laws and customs and traditions and build, using that as a building for what you, um, you want to design your own law as. For legal professionals, it's all about education. And I know there's many lawyers on the on the call here and very thankfully here, but educating not only ourselves, but other lawyers and judges about the national standards, insisting on that evidence and on notice. When they, there's those sections that say must in the legislation, enforce those, uh, challenge people to follow the law, challenge people to recognize that it is a law and it's a federal law and really put people on notice and work together with other professional organizations that want to enforce this law, build relationships, build relationships with the communities that you're working with, uh, build relationships um, to help people move forward. Include regular reassessment in, in your um, notes, include them in the court orders. If you can say right in the court orders, this will be reassessed every 
year, every two years, every six months, depending on the needs of the child. Uh, but you can put those right into the court order. It says right in legislation must include reassessment. Well, let's just put it in there and let's just start making that a normal part of the procedure. For delegated agency, it's about educating your social workers and really taking a look uh, at what you're doing. And what we found is many First Nations delegated agencies are already doing the work. They're already doing work and they are an example for other agencies to follow. So just continuing to look at what you're doing and how maybe you need to just adapt your intake forms uh, and taking a look at your court forms and what you're acquiring for court. And, and but celebrating the successes and the things that you are doing. At the lodge, we're working on creating a, a coffee table book on some of the best practices of agencies to say, look, these agencies have thought outside the box and they're examples of how you can use uh, this law to really support Indigenous children and try to think outside of the box, especially when it says uh, in the legislation where you must use reasonable efforts to ensure that the child stays with the family. Some of those reasonable efforts can look like buying food, providing wraparound services, providing tutors, providing cleaning, all of those opportunities and starting to think outside the box and advocating um, for your decision makers to apply those national standards and really leading by example. And I think a lot of people are doing that. And it's really, I see, I saw a lot of strength be met with the community. She said, don't just, don't ask for things from the federal government. She's like, just do it and take it. <laughs> She's like, stop asking for permission. Just go ahead and do it. You have that authority. And as a start, start being, don't wait and ask. Uh, for, for urban agencies and provincial agencies, identify and consult with the communities because uh, they're the best the best people to be able to know what's in the best interest of the children. Uh, being able to connect with family and look at that placement priority. In order to go through that, we're gonna have to work with our communities and being re really able to support each other. And it goes both ways for our communities to be able to start to be open to building those relationships. Uh, so that we really can work together. We've always said this law is about relationships, 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 being able to move forward and having to work with each other. Uh, learn by building um, relationships and how you can look at those national standards. Again, the national standards of floor, we can do better than that. We can do more than that, but those have to be the minimum standards. And the, the opportunity from across provinces has been very different. Some said, look, we're gonna comply. We're gonna change our legislation to ensure that we comply with Bill C-92. And then some provinces have said, no, I think we are there. We, we've met, we're at the national standards level uh, and that's open to interpretation for some. Important steps for your organization is again, to celebrate the things you are doing. I think if I, we've worked with some agencies that look, you're doing all of these things, you've met A, B, and C, and D. Let's really uh, use that as to celebrate because we look at this law uh, as something that's from outside, but we really can flip that and use it as a tool to advance our organizations, to advance our First Nations and look at our strengths and draw on that. Uh, some people have created practice checklists. Some people have created new court forms. Um, so again, it's just really looking at that opportunity of how we can move forward. We have some guides. Um, we have the social workers, a search provider guide. We have legal professional guides. We even have a guide for parents. And we're working on one for kids that is maybe a little bit more entertaining for kids. Uh, and then we also have the prenatal provisions when we worked with a, a health clinic, Indigenous health clinic on how, what does that prenatal provision mean and what kind of supports can we provide to that? So we're gonna move, with, move to our transition to our spirit bears as we all have them with today. And so we'll let Cindy talk about spirit bears plan. Thank you, Corin. I'm going to be really quick because I want to make sure we have enough time for questions, but we all have bears with us today. And that's really to promote this idea of equality uh, and equi substantive equity for all children. And uh, so please do, uh, this is a chance for you to get a hold of the Prime Minister, your members of Parliament, your members of the legislature, and I really encourage them to adopt and implement the Spirit Bear Plan. Uh, this was passed by the Chiefs of Assembly in 2017, so it's got that backing behind it. Next slide, please. And uh, we have Bear Witness Day coming up. So um, May 10th is our day when we honor Jordan River Anderson, the founder of Jordan's Principle. I'll just take a moment here to encourage everyone to always use the full term Jordan's Principle. Please do not use the acronym JP 
This is a request from the family as well as from the elders of Norway House Cree Nation uh, that say that really what we want to do is call and honor Jordan's spirit every time that we uh, talk about Jordan's principle. So uh, bears were Jordan's favorite toy, which is why Corrin's got a bear and Hadley's got a bear and Shelby and I, uh, we all have bears. Um, bring your bear to daycare worker school. You can, even if that's in your living room on May 10th, and then post a social media post about your bear. If you're an adult, it could be you and your bear. If you're a child, just post the bear for children's safety on the internet. And then uh, use the hashtags Jordan's Principal and Bear Witness Day. And don't forget to tag Spirit Bear. He has his own Twitter account and it's uh, got a, a thanks to the Twitter Corporation, it's all protected for, uh, for children. Next slide. We, uh, the Caring Society, are so honored to work with an Indigenous uh, film uh, production company headed up by Amanda, uh, Amanda Strong called Spotted Fawn Productions. And we'll be sharing this beautiful stop motion uh, animation telling the story of Jordan's principle and the ongoing work at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. Uh, it's called uh, Spirit Bear and Children Make History. It's based off a book by the same title that's available on our website in Cree, in Carrier, in English and in French for free download as part of the COVID. So you and your kids could watch it beforehand and then join us at the Caring Society on May 10th to honor Jordan's principle by having this virtual screening. Next slide. And that's it. I think we're open to questions. And this is a spirit bear, by the way, he's a proud member, Mem Bear. I think he's the only Mem Bear, yeah of the Indigenous Bar Association. And you can see here, he's paying his membership fees uh, to the uh, presidents and to the executive of the IBA. So he's all paid up. Great.